Welcome to this panel. My name is Johan Le Gelt. I'm a, a PhD a candidate in the French and Francophone studies uh, at Penn State. And it's a pleasure to chair this uh, wonderful panel. So I'm going to start by introducing our first speaker. Uh, Soon Young Park is an assistant professor in the Department of History and Art History at George Mason University. She's the author of Ideals of the Body, Architecture, Urbanism and Hygiene in Post-Revolutionary Paris, published by the University of Pittsburgh Press in 2018 as part of the Culture, Politics and the Built Environment series. Her current project, The Architecture of Disability in Modern France, uh, examines how architectural and urban developments in France um, accommodated and at times failed to accommodate blind, deaf and physically disabled subjects between 1750 and the early 20th century. Her work has been supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts and the Society of Architectural Historians, among others. Soon Young Park. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. So my paper today stems from a larger project that is still in the early stages um, on the architectural and spatial frameworks of disability across the long 19th century, as Johan was just describing. In embarking on this research, I was interested in the place of disabled subjects in the public sphere, both physical and discursive, and how their presence or absence intersects with more familiar narratives of social change. So disability studies as a field has been a rich and growing one since the late 20th century, and its scholars, whether they're coming from the humanities, social sciences, or health sciences, have recognized disability not as some marginal condition or experience, but as a key aspect of human experience that really reveals the complex interplay of forces, political, environmental, cultural, informing the relationship between individuals and society in highlighting the ubiquity of these other bodies. This literature also demonstrates the importance of analyzing disability as a social category alongside gender, race, and class, as Catherine Kudlick has argued. My presentation applies this, field to the field of, my, uh, applies this perspective to the field of visual culture by examining representations of the disabled subject in France as they intersected with discourses of gender, class, and citizenship between 1750 and 1850. An era of great political and social turmoil, as we know, um, but one that also witnessed the first institutional efforts to educate and integrate blind and deaf people. So using a range of popular prints and literature, I will argue that visual representations of the disabled subject ultimately struck at the heart of debates about citizenship and the public sphere in a society that was vacillating between monarchism and republicanism. So to begin, Depictions of blind and deaf people in the 18th century can be sometimes a little uncomfortable for contemporary eyes since they tended to reinforce stereotypes of an unfortunate class on the margins of society, reduced to seeking alms or even sometimes committed to asylums. And in both cases, popular representations tended to focus on male subjects, highlighting their unproductivity in a society that expected men to be the productive force of the nation. The trope of the blind beggar frequently appears in literature and prints of the age, as in some of these examples that I brought here. So this is a blind man and his dog on the very left. And in this second one, another image, another alms seeker, um, depicted both of these stem from the Cri de Paris genre, as listed here. Um, and these are literary and artistic compilations of the street cries of peddlers and hawkers that form the oral landscape of Paris. Uh, before the 1780s, the only official institution to aid blind people were hospices for the poor, beginning with the Hospice de Quinze-Vingt, which is labeled in the caption there, uh, founded by Louis IX in the 13th century created to house 300 poor blind people from the city of Paris. This hospice was a charitable institution providing confinement for blind mendicants rather than providing a route to rehabilitation or reintegration. Bl while blind alms seekers were usually included in these Cris de Paris collections, and this is another example, um, not the best reproduction, but it's a close-up that shows you here another pauvre aveugle as a musician. Um, and they usually form sometimes a figure apart in these collections and their lack of a useful trade. Their inclusion is predicated largely on a class association and the fact that they contributed to the racket of city life. 
Meanwhile, deaf people were often depicted as savages, lost to religion, morals, and civilization. Although their disability was less visible than blindness, so there are sort of less, I guess, evidence of them in these kinds of popular print series. Deaf individuals at the time were accepted in hospitals and asylums, at times even grouped with the mentally ill. So a coup célèbre at the end of the 18th century was the capture of the feral child, Victor of Aviron, also known as Le Sauvage de l'Aviron, um, who was discovered in South Central France and was initially thought to be congenitally deaf and mute. He was brought to well-known deaf, deaf pedagogues in Paris for education, who were ultimately unable to fully educate and restore him to society. Although later he was deemed to have his hearing, the wild child of Aviron linked popular conceptions of mutism, savagery, unsociability, and even idiocy. At a time when, sort of surprisingly, there were great advancements being made in deaf education. The image of this disabled social outcast continued into the 19th century, as in this Domia print of the blind beggar and his dog, or this depiction of blind musicians playing for money in an 1822 edition of Le Cri de Paris. Um, yet alongside such portrayals that contributed to the social marginalizing of disability, the Enlightenment had also begun engaging sensory disabilities from a philosophical perspective. A sensationalist theorists such as John Locke and Etienne Bonneau de Condillac began positing the physical senses as at the root of all understanding, thereby countering the previous deference to God as the source of all knowledge. The blind and deaf conditions interestingly struck at the heart of debates on cognition, sensibility, and human progress. This academic interest accompanied the first organized efforts to educate and integrate disabled subjects into society, paving, their way for, paving the way for one of the main legacies of the 19th century, as argued by Francois Buton, the idea that blindness and deafness are not mental handicaps. While blind people could be viewed with compassion, derision, or even fear during the Middle Ages, the Age of Enlightenment witnessed what William Paulson has called the desacralization of the blind. That is, from being a mystical and comprehensible condition beyond human control, perhaps even a visitation of divine punishment, as suggested in biblical stories, blindness became medically treated in some cases, for example, with advancements in cataract surgery, and increasingly the subject of scientific and philosophical inquiry. The famous problem first posited by Irish scientist William Molyneux in, the, in 1688 was a central locus for these debates. Uh, to summarize, if a man born blind had learned to distinguish a sphere and a cube of the same material by touch, would he be able to differentiate them by sight only if he were suddenly to gain the ability to see? That is to say, were the different forms of sensory knowledge interchangeable? For Molyneux and Locke, sight was perhaps not an immediate source of knowledge, but required dialogue with the other sensory, um, with the other senses for cognitive perception to take place. Such thinkers might view blindness as a limiting factor as a result in, in mental and moral advancement, but others elevated the blind to a privileged condition, a privileged status in their superior sense of touch. For example, Denis Diderot discusses touch as a possibly truer mechanism of knowledge in his Letter on the Blind for the Benefit of Those Who See from 1749, illustrated here, uh, which begins with a, an account of the blind man of Puizu, for whom tactility is the most useful of the senses. I would much prefer having long arms, he responds when asked if he would like his sight restored. Quote, it seems to me that my hands would better instruct me about what happens on the moon than your eyes or your telescopes. And then, I cease to see sooner than hands to touch." End quote. In his 1762 educational treatise, A Meal or Education, Jean-Jacques Rousseau also questioned the traditional privileging of sight over the other senses. He wrote, we are blind half our time with this difference. The really blind always know what to do, while we are afraid to stir in the dark. I had rather Emile's eyes were in his fingertips than in the Chandler's shop. End quote. If the blind prophet was an occasional trope in literature of past eras, the possibility of a deaf person attaining religious truth appeared to Christian thinkers as an even greater difficulty, an insurmountable one at times. In the Bible, non-believers had their speech taken away by God so that their blasphemy could not be heard. And in addition to the specter of divine punishment, many theologians believed that religious understanding could only be attained through the spoken and the heard word. 
As with blindness, however, this mystical perspective, absurdity, and accompanying stereotypes of savages lost to the world of morality and spirituality were gradually displaced in the 18th century by an intellectual discourse on the rationalization of language. So one of the poles of enlightenment debates on language, power, and social progress centered on the gestural communication system of deaf and mute people. At the center of various imagined fables and theoretical treatises was the proposition that in gestures lay a more transparent and effective language. One that could do away with the kind of ambiguities, the contentiousness, the superficiality that seemed to characterize most of the spoken exchanges of the day. Um, this is one example, Pierre-Charles Fabionion's um, Azor ou le Prince Enchanté from 1750 which tells the tale of an English merchant uh, shipwrecked on a foreign land where the mute population only communicate through a, a perfectly clear and transparent system of gestures. Um, another example is Condillac's Cours d'études pour l'instruction du Prince de Parme from 1775, in which he suggests the applicability of sign language for modern communications. As studied by Sophia Rosenfeld, a number of revolutionaries later even linked the educational program of deaf-mute children to a national secular project of social regeneration. For example, Charles Maurice de Talleyrand suggested sign language as a potential means of reforming and clarifying communications in the new political era, one that would be purged of the detritus of the past. The Enlightenment, of course, also set the stage for the rise of philanthropy at the end of the 18th century, guided by a philosophy of social reform and progress. With existing charities experiencing financial difficulties and against a surge of anti-clericalism that contributed to the 1789 revolution, liberal-minded reformists began advancing philanthropy as one of the responsibilities of modern citizens, not simply a Christian duty. And meanwhile, the revolution and the creation of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen raised important debates on public instruction and social welfare that contributed to the nationalizing of blind and deaf education in 1791. In Paris, the schools impacted by that last measure were the Abbé de Lépez Institute for Deaf Mutes and Valentin Aoui's Institute for Blind Youth. Uh, the story goes that in 1783, a former Jansenist priest, um, originally from Versailles, named Charles Michel de Lepe, went on an errand to visit a widow on the roof of Saint-Victor. And while awaiting her return, he tried in vain to converse with these twin sisters that he found there and was just completely ignored the entire time. Um, and he later discovered that they were deaf and mute and not just being rude. Um, and he also learned that a priest who had been trying to provide them with some education had recently died. And so Lepe felt this you know, kind of compassionate calling to help these unfortunate sisters. And he ultimated, ultimately devoted the rest of his life to the education of deaf and mute children. He began a small private school in 1760 in his own home, an initi initiative that attracted widespread patronage very quickly in this age of scientific advancement. And inspired by Lepe's work, a translator and calligraphy expert named Valentin Aoui founded an institute for blind youth in 1784, assisted by the recently formed Philanthropic Society of Paris. As these institutions grew in scope and scale, their various directors constructed multifaceted cur curricula that combined intellectual instruction and vocational training to create modern productive citizens out of disabled children. On his visit to the Deaf Institute in May of 1801, Jean-Antoine Cheptel, who was then Minister of the Interior, noted the striking moral effects of the productive labor that was taught in the ateliers at the school on the students. I quote, Several months ago, they were difficult, fierce, undisciplined, destructive and breaking everything, dirty and insensible of all ideas of honor and gratitude. Today, mirth is portrayed on their faces. They are happy and gentle. They no longer destroy. They amuse themselves in their leisure time because they are almost continually busy." End quote. Um, so this is undoubtedly somewhat exaggerated, um, but it, it's, this is description bespeaks a conviction in the power of labor and learning to not only generate joy, but also good mores and virtue and civic mindedness. From very modest beginnings, you know, as I said, sometimes in just the priest's own home, the two schools transferred locations to various expropriated government properties during the revolution, um, especially after their nationalization in 1791. And they were eventually provided with renovated, or in the case of the Blind Institute, just completely um, newly built campuses between the 1820s and the 1840s. Um, so to give you a sense of that architectural backdrop, um, these images show you the deaf school, the main entrance courtyard on the top here, the gardens at the back, where some of the like, gardening activities could take place. Um, 
And the second slide is a bird's eye view of the blind school in this um, sort of sort of like Beaux Arts symmetry and um, neoclassicism, um, which is on the Boulevard des Invalides. And for the remainder of this presentation, I'll focus on some of the depictions of student life in these new environments to think through the intersection of disability and class and citizenship being represented. This is from 1840. It's, the, it's a print of the lithography workshop at the renovated deaf school, um, which is one that really echoes, I think, Shabta's description that I quoted earlier. There's an air of useful and engaging industry that pervades the scene. The students are busy at work, too busy to notice the viewer observer, that is us. Um, they're creating prints, some of which are hung on the walls of this room. Um, and there are books on shelves in the background that speak of knowledge production and consumption of working class students who are both productive and cultured and educated. Um, students, in fact, worked in a range of ateliers at the institution, including metalworking, printing, woodworking, tailoring, and shoemaking. And the products of these, of these were actually sold to help finance school operations. Uh, the second image is one of my favorites. Um, it depicts blind children exercising in an outdoor gymnasium installed in the gardens of the Institute for Blind Youth. And I love it because of just the, the confidence um, placed in these <laughs> students' abilities to take care of, their, of themselves. Uh, this program was created a few years after the inauguration of the new school building in 1843 and was overseen by a military officer named Napoleon Lenné, who trained at the first military and public gymnasium established in Paris in 1820. And he went on to make a career of teaching physical education, which is still a very new thing at the time, in boys' schools and hospitals and asylums, girls' private schools, and eventually in the 1840s in both the bl uh, blind and deaf institutes. Uh, gymnastics practice in France originated in the military realm during the Restoration in response to concerns over national degeneration in the wake of the collapse of the First Empire. In this era of political reconstruction, the comprehensive development of the body's facilities as a means to moral and social progress became one of the central tenets in this project of national renewal. And you know, regular and ordered movements, some of what um, is being depicted here, you know, while swinging on bars or jogging in circles or you know, hurdling evenly spaced obstacles, these were thought to both strengthen the mind and through that to impart greater steadiness to the mind. As articulated by its foremost promoter in France, um, Colonel Francisco Amoros, I quote, gymnastics is the rational science of our movements, of their relation to our senses, our intelligence, our sentiments, our mores, and the development of all our faculties. Beneficence and common good are the principal aim of gymnastics, the practice of all social virtues, of all the most difficult and generous sacrifices, are its means. And health, the prolongation of life, the improvement of the human species, the increase of strength in individual and public wealth are the public results." End quote. So he's still just talking about gymnastics, like this is what that will do for the wealth and prosperity and social good of the French nation. In incorporating a program that addressed prevailing concerns over the nation's physical and moral well-being, the new institution for blind youth and institution for deaf mutes, designed for students lacking the sense of sight or hearing, manifested faith in the development of the other sensory faculties for not only individual but also social betterment. The ultimate aim was not simply education but the integration of disabled subjects in this larger project of regenerated citizenship. Um, so the scenes depicted in the previous two images lead me to this print, which is of a public demonstration of students' skills and learning in the assembly hall of the deaf school. If establishments of public assistance devoted to the moral, intellectual, physical, and social education of its population, these schools also partook, interestingly, in the culture of urban spectacle. The souls that were nourished in the chapel, the minds sharpened in the classroom, the body strengthened in the gymnasium, and the productive skills cultivated in the ateliers would be placed on display for the public to admire. And both schools were mentioned in guidebooks of the era. They were open to visitors several afternoons a week, um, as well as for periodic public concerts, student demonstrations as being illustrated here. Um, and the assembly hall was usually the crowning feature of the architectural establishment and often sometimes even shared um, space with a chapel as in the Blind Institute, sort of forming this um, moral and, and secular core of the institution. So the product of these state institutions, both male and female, would be civilized, as you see these young girls working at their you know, handicraft skills here. They would be productive, seeing students at the blind school working the print shop machinery. Um, and they would be cultured, integrated, not marginalized in the new social order. 
And while the assumption of music as the privileged realm of blind people continues here, we're seeing music as an artistic and harmonious enterprise and endeavor, not part of just the racket and din of urban street life as in the earlier Cris de Berry images. Uh, so to conclude, images of deaf and blind subjects in this age of reform gradually shifted from those of disabled adults burdening society to children as productive citizens in training. From their marginalized status in the 18th century, disabled people increasingly became an integral part of the discourse on education, hygiene, and citizenship, preoccupying French society between the late 18th and early 19th centuries. From the Enlightenment belief in rational methodical improvement, to the revolutionary project of national regeneration, and post-revolutionary anxieties about restoring social order, the disabled subject proved not some marginal condition, but I would argue an important test case, a measure for gauging the potentials and limits of human and social progress. And through their creation and dissemination, images not only reflected, but I would argue helped to construct the modern disabled subject as an enlightened productive citizen as shown here. Thank you.